I suppose it's customary for speakers to say, oh, I'm so glad to be here, and I really am glad to be here. I have to say, it's a, it's a unique opportunity to talk to Biola students. It was the very same thing this morning in class. You all did the same thing. Uh, when, uh, when Dr. Wright introduced me, he mentioned those two books, and just as among the students this morning, so it was with you, uh, the commentary on the treatise on law get a, got a stronger reaction than the book on sex. <laughs> and I'm fascinated by that, and I'm, 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 I'm impressed by your intellectual uh, interests, and I'm not sure what I think about the other side of that. <laughs> I also have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with any institution that has a dessert reception after a talk. Uh, I like dessert very much. I, I, uh, you heard him, uh, Dr. Wright compare me with the other three people in your speaker series, and he seemed to be comparing us to action figures. Uh, I suppose that uh, I suppose that since that 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 describes me so poorly, uh, I shouldn't be eating that dessert at all. But 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 uh, you know I, I mean my wife might might tell you look you don't get much action out of that guy he's he he doesn't even want to he doesn't even want to uh, want to want to fix the leaky leaky sink, and he also doesn't have much of a figure. So <laughs> anyway, I want to talk to you tonight about right talk. Rights talk, this kind of conversation that we have, everything, everybody is obsessed with rights. We can't seem to talk about anything except by converting it into langu the language of rights. And I want to investigate the question of do whether rights talk degrades the civic conversation. You know, like planets being swallowed by a black hole. Western people today, it isn't just Americans, although Americans have some of these tendencies to an even greater degree, are, are held fast in the sucking attraction of moral relativism and are accelerating into the singularity. Even today, not very many people describe themselves as moral relativists. But they despise moral judgments. They say things like, I don't believe in being judgmental. And each person has to make up his own morality. And what's morally right for you may not be morally right for me. That's how you know that they're relativists, and it often motivates the way that they talk about rights. Moral relativism, however, is queer stuff. It's much stranger than everyday black holes. Try telling a moral relativist there really is a moral law, don't you think? And it's just, it tells us what to do and it's just the same for you as it is for me. The relativist may become, will, will almost certainly become morally indignant that you've said this. And he sputters in outrage, who are you to tell me what's right and what's wrong? Get off my case. Now consider, how can the relativist be outraged if there is no morality? How can he become indignant if there is nothing to be indignant about? And this is why I say that this is queer stuff. It's very strange. Yet he is. Yet he is morally indignant. Apparently he does think that there is such a thing as moral law. In fact, he thinks that there is exactly one moral law. Thou shalt not tell me that there is a moral law. <laughs> He also believes in moral good and evil. Typically, the belief expresses itself like this. I'm as good as you. Everybody's idea of good is as good as everyone else's, and if you don't agree, you're evil. Let's call this phenomenon the relativist paradox. Though the relativist, relativist seems to say that there is no moral law, he insists on the moral rightness of his relativistic cause. Now, as the physicists tells us, tell us, Time seems to freeze around the black hole as you're, as you're approaching the event horizon when somebody enters it. Our current vice president has been frozen in the relativistic paradox for decades of conventional time. Uh, I hope you will not think that I'm being partisan in choosing him as an example of the kind of thing that I mean. But the other party certainly has difficulties of its own with relativism. Mr. Biden, however, presents a particularly persistent case of the disorder, and so he serves me very well as an illustration to, to exhibit some of the logical and, and uh, pathological features of this disorder. In 1991, then, he was a senator opposing the Clarence Thomas nomination to the Supreme Court. He worried in an op-ed piece in the Washington Post that the nominee might believe in horrors a static set of unchanging moral principles rather than an evolving body of ideals. 
His statement was relativistic because it denied that there is such a thing as an unchanging moral principle. That was the objection to Mr. Thomas. But the statement also exhibited the relativistic paradox because at the same time that it seemed to deny that there is such a thing as an unchanging moral principle, it insisted in another way that there is. For consider, what did Mr. Biden mean by suggesting that moral ideals evolve? I don't think that he meant that they undergo meaningless, random, and arbitrary change. After all, he approved of this so-called evolution. What he meant, I think, is that moral ideals are getting better. Well, perhaps in some ways they are. Uh, I think it's been an improvement that, that uh, most Americans no longer approve of slavery, for instance. Um, but to suggest that moral ideals are changing for the better presupposes a standard of moral comparison a standard of better and worse. You can't say they're getting better unless there is a better. So, uh, so that yardstick can't change. That means that even in order to say that our moral ideals have no fixed content and that it's a dangerous mistake for a person on the Supreme Court to believe that any moral ideals are fixed, Mr. Biden needs at least one moral principle which does have fixed content to tell us um, why these changes are for the better. Now, Mr. Biden also worried in those days, I will come up to the present, trust me, that the nominee might view the natural law as a, quote, a specific moral code regulating individual behavior rather than as something that, quote, protects moral freedom even in areas of moral choice. But to suggest that instead of laying down a moral code, the natural law protects moral choice is to say that it is a moral code, for it does limit moral choice. How does it limit moral choice? It declares exactly one restriction which it considers all important. That restriction is, thou shalt not restrict choice. That is a choice you may not make. We tell you, don't do it. So once again, we encounter the relativistic paradox, and now the plot thickens. We have just seen that if you say that I must not restrict moral choice, then my moral choice has been restricted, for I'm not allowed to choose to restrict moral choice. But it's logically impossible to put only one moral choice off limits by saying that the only choice that we're not allowed to make is to restrict moral choice. That's not possible. It is not possible logically to say that's the only choice that we're putting off limits. Um, it's just double talk. Consider rape, for instance. You may either permit rape or forbid it. Either way, you're restricting someone's choice. Some relativists, and I've even seen writing on this subject, trying to explain why, why, uh, why forbidding, uh, forbidding rape is somehow not restricting choice. They try to escape the dilemma by saying that the rapist wants to restrict the woman's choice, but the woman doesn't want to restrict anyone's choice. Nonsense. Nonsense. If you permit rape, you're restricting the woman's choice because her choice would have been not to be raped. If you forbid rape, though, you're restricting the rapist's choice because his choice would have been raping her. How do we decide which of the two choices is sacrosanct and which one isn't? The only way to do so is to fall back on a moral principle which tells us that rape is wrong and resisting rape is not wrong. So you aren't merely putting one choice off limits, that is the choice to restrict moral choice. You're also putting another choice off limits, hopefully the choice to rape, and so it goes. And the further one thinks, and in, in the very nature of things to make any decisions um, about what we may tolerate and what we may not tolerate, you're making, you're making all sorts of moral choices at every moment. Now, not only is it logically impossible to put only one choice off limits, but we also find that when Mr. Biden suggested that he wanted to put only one choice off limits, he didn't really mean it. If we leap, I promised you that I would do this, from the 1990s to the present, where he is still stuck in the same event horizon, we find that Mr. Biden, who is now vice president, supports his boss's health care law. 
a law which requires churches and other religious employers to provide employee health insurance coverage for practices such as abortion, even though these practices are against their consciences. Mr. Biden chooses to restrict the choice of these organizations, the choice of them to do what? The choice not to subsidize choices which the organizations themselves consider immoral and loathsome to conscience. Instead, he insists that they choose his way, which is to subsidize them. And so we advance toward the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is this. The relativistic talk of protecting choices in general never really protects choices in general, because that cannot be done. You can protect some choices, but it is impossible to protect all choices. To protect some choices logically entails restricting others. For example, to protect the decision I choose, that someone else will subsidize my act, is to restrict the decisions of other people who choose not to subsidize my act and vice versa. So on close examination, what the moral relativist really does is forbid the choices that he doesn't like and to permit the choices that he does like. You may now say, so what? Doesn't all morality do that? Doesn't all morality encourage or permit or even command good choices and restrict bad ones? Well, yes, of course, of course it does. But there is a difference. The moral relativist doesn't do it in the good old-fashioned honest way by explaining why the choices that he restricts are morally bad and why the choices that he encourages are morally good. Instead, he pretends that he's not restricting anything at all, that he's only following what is in fact a logically impossible policy of protecting choices in general. In other words, he enforces his morality, he crams his morality down your throat by pretending A, that he isn't enforcing it, and B, that it isn't a morality. So moral relativism isn't just a false and a bad and an illogical philosophy, it is a crooked and deceptive philosophy. Now, you may object also. You may say, Mr. Biden is an easy target. When I back away from this microphone, by the way, does my voice fade? Do I need to be close to it for you to hear me? I'm wearing a lapel mic too, but that may only be for recording purposes so, long as, so far as I know. When I back off like this, can you still hear me? Yes, okay, good. All right, that's what I want because I'm a pacer. I like to walk around, uh, and I have good company there. You know, Moses was uh, Moses uh, 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 stuttered, and stutterers often walk around and so forth to pace their to pace their speech. Uh, Aristotle did that. He was a pacer. Some people think for the same reason. He was called the peripatetic philosopher, which means that he walked around. Uh, it sounds like it's something very fancy and has to do with some sophisticated moral doctrine, but it just means he was a pacer. <laughs> All right. Um, I was saying that moral relativism then isn't just a false and a bad philosophy, it's a crooked and a de defective philosophy because it enforces its morality by pretending that it isn't enforcement and pretending that it isn't a morality. Now you may object, I was saying that Mr. Biden is an easy target. Maybe he's not crooked and dishonest, but just a little bit stupid. <laughs> Perhaps he is not so much deceiving others as deceiving himself. Well, nothing could be more common than that in our day and age. Perhaps he's merely trying to make some sort of peace with his uneasy conscience, in his case, an uneasy Christian conscience because he is Catholic. I think this may very well be true. But this kind of stupidity is not accidental. It is motivated, it is motivated and the motivation is bad. If I lie to myself to make peace to, with my conscience, it is nonetheless a lie and it may be criticized for what it is. You may also object that Mr. Biden doesn't ever say, I am a moral relativist. Mm, quite so. Moral relativists hardly ever do say, I am a moral relativist. The heyday of ethical philosophy that said, 
uh, I am, a, you know, I propose moral relativism was about a half century ago and it was shot down rather quickly. Most people do, most relativists do not admit what they are or even know that that is what they are. Instead, as, w as we've seen from Mr. Biden's example, they use moral language for their moral relativism. They say things like, I am a person who believes in moral rights. Let's talk about that language. That's where we come back to the topic stated in the title of this talk, Does Rights Talk Degrade the Civic Conversation? Certainly, rights talk is not the only moral language that relativists use, but it is very mainstream. In fact, rights talk is probably the most common moral language of relativism today. And it's certainly the moral language which is most highly esteemed by our contemporary ruling class. To illustrate, allow me to choose another target, one which I hope you will not consider as easy a target as Mr. Biden, and that is the United States Supreme Court. In 1992, a four-judge plurality of the court wrote the famous or as some people might say, infamous mystery passage, as it is often uh, called. How many of you have heard of the mystery passage? Okay, a sprinkling, that's great. With some of you are teachers, that doesn't count. <laughs> Which reads as follows. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Stirring, eh? Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood, were they formed under compulsion by the state. I want to read that again. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood if they were formed under the compulsion of the state. Now, at first, the mystery passage seems perfectly harmless, and in fact, perhaps even laudable. It reads as though the plurality is not talking about what we may do, but about what we may believe. And it sounds as though they are assuring us that the government is not to be allowed to compel us to believe in things that we don't consider true. And that would be a good thing. It might be good if that were what the plurality means, but that is not what the plurality is saying at all. The case was called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It was an abortion case. The plurality wasn't giving its reason for thinking that a person may believe in abortion without coercion by the state. It was giving its reason for thinking a per that a person may have an abortion. In other words, the plurality wasn't just declaring a right to define one's concept of existence of meaning of the universe and of the mystery of human life. It was declaring a right to act on one's concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. I may kill an unborn child as I define existence if he doesn't exist. If I, or if as I define meaning, his life has no meaning. Or if as I define the universe, he doesn't belong in it. Or if as I define the mystery of human life, he is excluded from that mystery and he doesn't have a life then I may kill him. Now consider this amazing right. If I may act, if I may act on, not just form, my own definitions of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life, even to the point of the private use of lethal violence against the smallest and weakest human beings, then why may I not act the same way and for the same reasons against other human beings who happen to be born. If by my definition of existence, a next door neighbor has no real existence, then I may strangle him. If by my definition, a woman's life has no meaning, then I may slit her throat. If by my definition, a business competitor has no place in the universe, then I may have him assassinated. If by my definition, a, my political opponent is living a false life, then I may set off a bomb in his automobile. Why is such reasoning valid in thinking of abortion and not in thinking of our neighbors in the public square?
Now, of course, the members of the court didn't say that. Even though it follows inexorably from their premises, they didn't draw the inference that you may do that. They don't really think that we may act on any definitions whatsoever, even though they said so, concerning existence, meaning the universe and the mystery of human life. They don't really believe that so long as we are acting on our personal definitions, we may carry them privately to lethal conclusions. No, the plurality approves only of abortion. So what they really mean is that we may act on definitions which deny life, existence, meaning, and a place in the universe to the people whom they themselves deem expendable, that is, unborn children, while affirming the life, existence, meaning, and place in the universe of everyone else. Remember this, please. Whenever a moral relativist says, you may do anything you please, he always has in mind the tacit condition but I decide for everyone what anything includes. The title of my talk asks whether rights talk degrades the civic conversation. Now as you can see from my examples, obviously it can degrade the civic conversation. But the kind of rights talk that I've been describing does more than degrade the civic conversation. It actually keeps the civic conversation, the public debate, from taking place at all. For in a genuine conversation, an honest conversation, an authentic dialogue about how to live, in a real exchange of views about which choices to celebrate and which choices to restrict, each side gives reasons for thinking as it does, which the other side tries to answer. But if one side pretends not even to be proposing a view of how to live, of which choices to celebrate, or of which choices to restrict, if it merely cries liberty, freedom, rights, your own definition of everything, then in actual fact the civic conversation has not begun has not begun. To be sure, the non-relativist side may try to begin it by giving reasons for thinking as it does about how to live. But the relativist side doesn't answer this reasoning and it doesn't give reasons for thinking as it does. It merely cries, how dare you cram your morality down my throat? We may think of this kind of rights talk as a form of moral tyranny. It is the sort of thing that the Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI had in mind when he warned of the dictatorship of moral relativism. Relativ relativists, of course, think that what they propose is the opposite of dictatorship because everyone may do as he pleases, but you've just heard why that isn't in fact what's happening. As he explained in another talk, dictatorship is not just the enslavement of man, it is, I quote, the enslavement of man under the pretext of liberating him, and that's what this kind, this relativist sort of rights talk does. It enslaves us under the pretext of liberating us. It forces a certain morality upon us not by persuading us that it is in fact true, but by pretending that it is not a morality and therefore needs no explanation, justification, or defense. This pretext points up another essential feature of relativistic rights talk. Not only is it dictatorial, but it compels its practitioners to lie. Enforcing its view of morality under the disguise of not enforcing morality. And lies multiply themselves. Lies breed. They're like rabbits. They ramify. They metastasize. They proliferate. They spread. They have to because lies require other lies to prop them up. You may remember what happened when you were a little kid, when you were a child and you tried to fool your parents. Pa most parents are pretty good at penetrating childish deceptions. So whenever you told a lie, you ended up having to tell another lie to cover up the first one. Right? Do you remember that? And they caught you at that. And then you had to tell a third lie to cover up the second one. And you had to tell a fourth lie to cover up the third one. And so it went. So eventually you could hardly keep track of what was true and what was false. 
um, and in which lies you told and which you hadn't. The sort of right stock that I have been describing, the form of moral tyranny that makes its way by pretending that its goal is universal liberty, has all the same problems writ large. Its practitioners must also multiply their lies to cover the previous lies. They too have difficulty keeping track of what is true and of what is false. They are permanently somewhat confused because they're not just lying to everyone else, they are lying to themselves. And their political success depends upon keeping, their, their political success depends on keeping other people as confused as they are and the peace of their consciences depends on keeping themselves as confused as they are at the moment. Consequently, as their kind of talk rises and becomes the norm, the level of the civic conversation sinks. Words are being exchanged. A conversation is not taking place. As the civic conversation slips into the swamp, it loses its grip on both the moral virtues, such as frankness and honesty, and on the intellectual virtues, such as clarity, perceptiveness, and the ability to follow a premise to its conclusions. More and more, rational arguments tend to be replaced with expressions of feeling Instead of saying, here is the reason why I think this is true, people will say things like, I want, I feel, and all too often that's interchangeable with, I have a right. That is the trouble with right stock. And yet, and yet, and yet, does it have to be that way? I actually have been describing not rights talk of every possible sort, but a particular kind of rights talk. The kind which is dominant today, the kind which Harvard Law Professor Marianne Glendon, who may have been the, per the first person to use the expression rights talk and wrote a book about it, describes as simplistic rather than subtle prodigal in bestowing the label of rights on any claim whatsoever, insular in its tendency to ignore all other considerations except claims of rights, and silent with respect to personal, civic, and collective responsibilities. But could there be another kind of rights talk? One which strengthened the civic conversation, the public debate, which made it possible to have a real and authentic and genuine dialogue, could there, instead of destroying it, could there be a kind which is subtle rather than simplistic, which is cautious rather than prodigal, which is sensitive to other moral considerations, and which is densely rooted in our personal, civic, and collective responsibilities? Now, I think that the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. What is necessary is this. To uproot rights talk from the soil of moral relativism and to plant it anew in the soil of the natural moral law. To uproot it from the soil of moral relativism and to plant it anew in the soil of natural moral law. Now, I don't mean what Mr. Biden called natural law. He thought there is one natural law, exactly one, only one, restrict individual choice. I mean rather what the expression meant to those spiritual and philo philosophical giants of the classical natural law tradition, which was the spine of Western ethical and jurisprudential thought for centuries and centuries. Instead of thinking of rights as things which shield us from duties and responsibilities which we find inconvenient, we would have to think of rights as things which accompany our duties and empower us to fulfill our responsibilities. Now, if you happen to be familiar with the passing fashions of political theory during the past 30 years or so, probably uh, you aren't, and it's only a few old fogies like me who may happen to specialize in the subject who know about this, but there are a few such fogies in here, right? You know who you are. You may be thinking, oh no, 
not another communitarian. There was for a while a movement, it was called for a while communitarianism, which proposed connecting rights more closely with responsibilities. And it faded and it died. And so you may think that I'm trying to exhume and reanimate the corpse so that communitarianism would walk the earth again, this time as a zombie, <laughs> which at least might get some credits on television, right? No. May it rest in peace. <laughs> communitarianism was mostly the creature of disillusioned ex-relativists who were dismayed by what relativism had wrought but who could not quite bring themselves to cast loose from it. Why do I say that? Well, the communitarians recognized that in order to make their project work, they needed a foundation for so-called moral values. But what most of them tried to do is to treat the community itself as the source of moral value. That's why they called themselves communitarians. If you do that, you haven't cast loose from moral relativism after all. You've merely replaced one sort of moral relativism with another. Instead of building your house on dry sand, you've built your house on quicksand. For instead of treating every individual's idea of right and wrong as equally good, you've merely decided to treat every community's idea of right and wrong as equally good. Now, if, like people of my own age, you spend much time in doctor's offices, <laughs> you have probably encountered this way of thinking in National Geographic magazine. Um, while waiting for my allergy injection one day, I read a creepy article <laughs> in that esteemed journal about African voodoo rituals. The author vividly described, I, it held my attention, with the help of many photographs, how participants in these rituals invite demons to possess them and apparently, from his account of things, succeed. But he couldn't bring himself to suggest that that might not be a good idea. <laughs> After all, demon possession was what their community valued. And isn't it all wonderful how diverse communities can be? <laughs> Even though those of you who may have thought that I was merely proposing communitarianism all over again were mistaken then. You were right about one thing. Communitarianism is kind of old hat now, but I am proposing something old. I'm actually proposing something a lot older than that. Uh, the soil in which the concept of natural rights first took root was the classical natural law tradition. I'm not referring to what early modern social contract thinkers of the 16 and 1700s whom you may have read about in your classes like John Locke and Thomas Hobbes called natural law. The thinning and the flattening and the oversimplification and the outright mistakes of such men bear a lot of the blame for the problems that we face today. Rather, I'm thinking of the classical natural law tradition which came before them and which those thinkers threw out the window. So you see that I'm not proposing that we yank up rights talk from its original relativistic soil and transplant it into a moralistic pot. No, I'm proposing uprooting it from the relativistic pot into which it's fallen and transplanting it into its original moral garden. I'm not the only Christian thinker to have proposed something like this or the only philosopher to have done so. So have others and I think those others are right. Now you may be wondering what on earth is he talking about natural law? Natural law uh, is not always known by the expression natural law. St. Paul, for instance, called it the law written on the heart. Natural law means objective moral law. The point of calling it natural, natural law is a philosopher's expression, is that its norms are rooted in our nature. In other words, in how God created us. That's what makes them objective because we didn't make up our nature. We receive it as a gift. 
It is what it is. The facts of our nature determine what is good for us and they set the parameters of how the good can and cannot be achieved just because these facts do set the parameters of how good can and cannot be achieved, they generate both duties and rights. Now that sounds a little abstract. Most people are not comfortable with abstractions without an illustration. I sympathize with that. Let me illustrate. For example, the duties of the family are correlated with the natural facts that what? The natural facts that we come into the world immature that we are designed to be brought up in families, that each child needs a mother and a father. That context explains why it is, why it is really true that I should honor my own father and mother, that I really should take care of and love my children, and why I really should be faithful to their mother, my wife. Moreover, these duties there are the natural facts. These duties are, these natural duties are rooted in these natural facts. And these duties are further correlated with natural rights. The mother and the father have a right to direct the children's education and nurture. And their ch children have a right to their care. To give just one more example, the duties of religion are correlated with the natural fact that man is ordained to seek and follow the truth about God and the moral good. This is a fact about our nature. We are restless if we know nothing about what we are here for, what it all means. We want to know the truth. We need to know the truth. We cannot be fulfilled unless we are in conformity with that truth. We crave it. We have a truth word longing. You would think that people don't because so many people crave things like pleasure and pursue it even at the cost of making themselves stupid and becoming unable to pursue the truth. But you know, that only suppresses the longing for truth. It doesn't destroy it. It doesn't wipe it out. It only suppresses it and frustrates it. And sometimes these strange ways of life are the result of the, mo of the distress and the disturbance and the unhappiness that follows. Now leaving aside the supernatural aspects of the matter then, knowing and being formed by the truth is necessary to our natural well-being. Seeking it is a natural duty and this duty is correlated with natural rights. In particular, individuals and communities of individuals, because we are social creatures who need to cooperate with each other in searching for truth, have the right to freedom from undue interference by the state or from other individuals in the pursuance of this search for the truth. Now, I've been speaking of natural rights, and sometimes people misunderstand. You may think that I mean absolute rights, rights that have no conditions. Uh, I don't. But the considerations which limit these rights are not arbitrary. They are exactly the same as the considerations which give them birth. For instance, parental rights to direct the, the education and nurture of the children are rooted in what? In the children's well-being. This is what they need. Therefore, it would be incoherent to suggest that parents may starve or abuse their children in the name of parental rights. Religious rights to seek and follow God are rooted in conscience, but this very same conscience also directs us not to murder, so it would be inco incoherent to suggest that religious groups may murder innocents in the name of God. Now those are easy cases, sure. And I agree that there are such things as hard cases. <coughs> Most moral decisions, despite the fact that we like to say when we're trying to evade responsibility for our own bad moral decisions, we like to say, well, it's so hard, uh, you know, I can't tell what's right and wrong. Everything is shades of gray. Nothing is black and white. I'm only trying to walk through the fog. The fact is that on, on most moral choices, the sunlight is shining pretty brightly, right? Should you, should you sleep with the neighbor lady instead of your wife? No. Should you cheat on the exam? No. Should you, uh, should you uh, keep your promises? Yes. Should you, uh, should you be just to those that you're working with? 
Uh, yes. Now, there aren't very many hard cases, but there are some. And some of the hard cases are very hard cases. And I don't claim to have the right answer to every one of them. As Sir Thomas More is presented as saying, this isn't an actual historical quote, but he is presented as saying this in the wonderful play, A Man for All Seasons, God made the angels to show him splendor, as he made animals for innocence and plants for their simplicity. But man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. Wittily meaning by his wits. If it is only in the tangle of our minds that we may serve God, then so let us serve him. Yet let's not blame him. For every tangle of our minds, some tangles are our own doing. They lie not in the complicated nature of our things, but in ourselves. And so, even though there are such things as hard cases, I think most of our difficulty of thinking about rights and thinking about their limits lies not in the, the genuinely hard cases, but in the relativistic habits of thought which we bring to bear on all the cases. In the name of equal rights, for instance, we try to convince ourselves that any sexual association whatsoever is entitled to the respect due to marriage, that any living arrangement whatsoever is entitled to the respect due to family, that any group of people who believe anything whatsoever is entitled to the respect due to religion. One of the most spectacular examples of unnecessary tangle is the Supreme Court's effort to make sense of the constitutional guarantee of the free exercise of religion. That's a right, since the whole basis of religious liberty is our rational and natural impulsion to seek and follow the truth about God and about moral good, a point about which, by the way, the constitutional framers would have agreed with me, one would have thought that the court would find it easy to construe the meaning of the clause, but one would be wrong. The court does not construe its meaning at all. Construction, statutory construction, requires you to look carefully at the grammar and the vocabulary, the terms that are used in the, in the clause, in the phrase, in the sentence, and work out, and work out what this means piece by piece. But the court tries to enforce the guarantee of the free exercise of religion without ever defining other, either religion or its exercise. Does that astonish you? It is true. It tries to tell you what, it, what, what uh, on the basis of the free exercise clause, what the government may and may not do, without ever telling you what, what is an exercise, what kind of exercise is free, or what religion is. A colleague of mine at a conference that I attended not so long ago suggested that the free exercise clause protects the religious liberty of Satanists. Now, I'm not terribly worried about a Satanist takeover, <laughs> even though I am in California. <laughs> and so I'm not using Satanists as an example here because of some panic of a, of a Satanic conspiracy. But they do, by, very, by virtue of the extremity of the case, they make some of the logical features of the situation rather clear, and so they're a helpful illustration. If religious liberty is rooted in the natural right to seek and follow the truth about God and moral good, then I ask, what has that got to do with Satanism? The Satanist doesn't even claim to seek the truth about God or, or what is good. My colleague suggested that that was the case, but it isn't true. To be a, a Satanist is precisely to worship the father of lies, precisely to repudiate the aspiration to moral goodness, precisely to celebrate ignorance and evil, and to do all of these things not accidentally or unknowingly, but knowingly and on purpose. A Satanist cannot in good faith appeal to the liberty of his conscience because the whole point of his sect is to debauch and spoliate that conscience. That is what he wants. 
Now, there may be purely prudential reasons to tolerate Satanist worship assemblies. I wouldn't call for establishing a Satanist squad in the police departments to seek them all out and say, you can't, you can't worship or you, know, you, can't, you can't sing hymns to the devil or whatever it is that they do. Uh, for instance, perhaps the attempt to suppress them would merely drive them underground. That's what I mean by a prudential reason. It may even glamorize them so that they would attract more adherents than before. But whatever reasons there might be for toleration, by no stretch of the imagination could a right to religious liberty be the reason for toleration. If we stretch religion to cover deliberate contempt for God and inflate conscience to include the deliberate mockery of conscience in a constitutional context, and suggest that this is what the framers meant, then I think respect for the dignity of conscience and the free exercise of religion mean nothing. To conclude, yes, rights talk has degraded the civic constitution. It's done worse than degrade it. It has prevented it from even getting, properly getting started. It's undermined our moral virtues, it's undermined our intellectual virtues, and our very ability to have such a conversation. But no, rights talk does not have to work like that. What we need to do is cut the language of rights from the sterile stump of relativism and graft it back on to the fruitful vine of natural law. Considering how far we have come. Is it too late for us to do this? Or can we still muster up the moral and the spiritual and the political courage that it would take? I don't know the answer to that question. There is no way to know in advance. The only way to find out is to try. Thank you very much. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.